What is a statement? A statement in logic is a thing which is either true or false. That's it. It doesn't have to carry any sort of information. It doesn't make a claim about the real world. It is simply a thing which is either true or false. To represent statements, we're going to be using single letters, such as P or Q, typically lowercase letters, typically beginning with P. It doesn't really matter, of course, what symbols you use. Sometimes we'll use A, B, and C, or X, Y, Z, or P, Q, R, and so forth. But lowercase letters is the convention. The first thing we learn how to do with statements is discuss its negation. So if you have a statement P, the negation of that statement is to put a little tilde in front of it and pronounce it as not P, or the negation of P. This is itself a new statement created out of the original. The statement not P is exactly the opposite of P. So the statement P is either true or false, and since we're declaring that not P is another statement, it must be true or false. And when P is true, not P is false. And when P is false, not P is true. Any statement that we form either out of a single letter or negation of a single letter is what's called a literal. Momentarily, we'll be learning how to make more complicated statements, okay, in which case it will be handy to distinguish larger compound statements from these individual letters. And these small individual letters are called literals. They are the sort of unit building blocks out of which we are going to build new statements. The first fundamental law about handling statements that we're going to discuss is the law of contradiction. The law of contradiction states that no statement is both true and false. This is usually not a very controversial thing to put out there. We don't want to have scenarios where statements can be true and false at the same time. The second fundamental law regarding statements is called the law of the excluded middle. And this says that a statement must be either true or false. This is really baked into the definition that we said back at the beginning. A statement is a thing which is either true or false. So we can't have something in between. Intuitively, we may want to live in a world where we can say things like this is sometimes true or this is sort of true. But for now, a statement must either be true or false. There is no intermediate value between the two. If I combine this with the law of contradiction, a statement must be either true or false, but it cannot be both at the same time. So if P is true, then not P is false, but if P is false, then not P is true, and this really accounts for all possible combinations of true and false for a statement P and its negation not P. It is worth considering that the negation symbol does not mean this is now false. It simply means the opposite of. It is completely possible for the statement not P to be true if the statement P was false. So just because it has this negation symbol in front of it doesn't mean as a unit that it must be false. It still might either be true or false. Finally, we move on to the construction of compound statements, otherwise known as sentences. There are a few ways that we can build more complicated statements out of smaller ones. Okay, we can put this V in between them, which we read out loud as P or Q. This is called the disjunction of the two statements P and Q. If I have any two statements, whether they be literals or not, okay, I can also put this wedge-shaped symbol between them read P and Q, this is called the conjunction of the two statements, and I can put an arrow in between them, and this builds a new statement called a conditional statement, P implies Q, or if P, then Q. Anytime you take statements and make larger statements out of them according to these constructions, it's called a compound statement, or sometimes called a sentence. Finally, another little rule that we introduce is that you can always put parentheses around a statement, and that is still a statement. Parentheses are just about visual clarity for the reader. They do not affect whether statements are true or false. Okay? We also have not really addressed what uh, disjunction, conjunction, and conditional statements have to do with truth and false. We will get to that, however. But usually we're not going to distinguish between a statement P and a statement with parentheses around it. The parentheses are just for your human reader, but do not really affect the logic of what's going on. 
So let's take a look at an example of building a compound statement. Here is a legitimate statement, and it might at first look like just a big jumble of symbols, but let's discuss point by point how we can build this up. So P, Q, and R are all literals. They're all statements. So I can negate Q, and this is also a statement. Since P is a statement and the negation of Q is a statement, I can put the wedge in between them and conjoin them. So this overall is a statement, and I can now put parentheses around it as well. P and R are both statements individually. They're literals, and therefore I can disjoin them. So P or R is a legitimate statement. I can put parentheses around it, and that's really the same thing. Since P or R is a statement and Q is a statement, I can put a conditional arrow in between them. Q implies P or R is a legitimate statement. Therefore, I can put parentheses around it, and I can negate it, and I have a legitimate statement here. But if this overall is a statement, then I can negate it. And this is also a legitimate statement. I could keep going, of course, but we're going to stop throwing negations on it here. And observe, we have shown that this can be built up as a legitimate statement, and so can this here. And therefore, we can put a conditional arrow in between them, and we have a legitimate statement. We haven't discussed whether this is true or false and how to determine that, but for the moment, at least we agree, yes, according to the rules, that whenever you have a statement, you can negate it. If you have two statements, you can disjoin them or conjoin them or put a conditional arrow in between them. Sure, starting from the literals P, Q, and R, we were able to construct this. Let's do another example. Here is something that isn't a statement. Well, why not? So the negation sign here, the only way we can introduce the negation sign is to have a statement and then negate it. So what comes after the negation sign has to be a statement, and there is no way to begin a statement with a closed parenthesis. Okay, I can put parentheses around a statement, but that would require beginning with opening that parenthesis. I can't close off a parenthesis at the beginning of a statement. It just can't be done. Also, the disjunction symbol over here, the only way you can introduce a disjunction is to have a statement on both sides of it. Now, to the right of the disjunction is the literal Q, but what about to the left of the disjunction? The first thing I see is this conditional arrow, and there is no way for a statement to end with a conditional arrow because conditional arrows can only come in between two statements. So since the conditional arrow must have a statement on, on either side, similarly, what comes to the left, even if I you know, maybe accept that this is a statement. It can't be because of this negation here. But what's to the right of the conditional arrow? The first thing I see is the disjunction, and there is no way to build a statement that begins with the disjunction. So I can't have a legitimate statement to the right of this conditional arrow. So we have a few obstructions that mean I can't possibly build this up, okay? I cannot follow an arrow with a disjunction. I cannot precede a disjunction with an arrow and the negation has to come before a statement. There's a lot of things in here that make this very meaningless. Let's take a look closer at conditional statements. So if you have a conditional statement, we've got this conditional arrow and a statement on the left and right. As written, I just have the literals P and Q, but in general, remember, this could be any statement and this could be any statement. So the statement to the left of the conditional arrow is called the hypothesis of that conditional statement, and the statement to the right is called the conclusion. So take a look at the following. We've got a conditional arrow, and to the left is the legitimate statement P or not R. So that's the hypothesis of this conditional statement. And to the right of the conditional arrow is the conjunction Q and P, that's the conclusion. But the hypothesis and or conclusion of a conditional statement could certainly be another conditional statement. In the following, there are two arrows that show up. Okay, there's an arrow here and there's an arrow here. This first arrow has hypothesis P and conclusion Q. What about this arrow? What is its hypothesis? What is the statement that precedes this arrow? It's not just Q, it's actually this entire conditional statement. P implies Q is the hypothesis of this arrow, 
and the conclusion is negation Q or not Q. Overall, looking at this as an entire constructed statement, okay, the fundamental building block is this conditional arrow, so I would say the hypothesis overall is P implies Q, and the conclusion overall is not Q. Let's take a look at another example here. Here is a statement that is ambiguously put, P implies Q or R. Now the ambiguity has to do with this conditional arrow compared to this disjunction. What is the conclusion of this conditional arrow and what is the left argument of this disjunction? There are two ways we could construct this statement based on how we begin with our literals P, Q, R and build it up step by step. We could begin by disjoining Q or R and then use that statement as the conclusion of our conditional statement. P implies the entire statement Q or R. So the left argument of the disjunction is Q and the right argument or the conclusion of the conditional arrow is Q or R. But we also could have begun by forming the conditional arrow and then disjoined it with R. In this construction, the conclusion of the conditional arrow is Q and the left argument of the disjunction is P implies Q. Both of these are legitimate statements, but they are not the same thing. And just looking up here, it's a little unclear which one it's supposed to be. But as with uh, arithmetic, you know, adding and multiplying, there's an order of operations that clarifies things. The first thing you need to account for are parentheses, just like in arithmetic. After that come negations, conjunctions, disjunctions, and last, conditional arrows. So this is an order of operations that tells you how to resolve things. So above, the first thing we want to take care of are any parentheses, but as it was written up above, there are none. Are there any negations? No. Are there any conjunctions? No. Is there a disjunction? Yes. So looking as closely as possible at this disjunction, I say its right argument is R and its left argument is the first statement I can construct and that's Q. So the disjunction Q or R is used to form a statement and then I can account for this conditional arrow. So based on the standard order of operations, we would interpret it like this. There we have it. But judicious use of parentheses makes sure that your reader never gets confused, okay? It's not so much that there are trick questions where we're going to try to force you to be clever about order of operations so much as when you write statements that mix different symbols, parentheses are simply helpful to make sure people don't make mistakes. Sure, there is a standard order of operations that helps us figure out what it's supposed to be, but better than relying on the order of operations is to just use sets of parentheses so no one is confused to begin with. In my experience, students are far too cautious about using parentheses when a couple of extra sets would have really clarified things. So don't be afraid to put parentheses around things to help uh, make sure that it's totally clear what you meant to say. And that way, you won't get confused, your reader won't get confused, your instructor won't get confused. Okay, that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we're going to discuss how to determine whether compound statements like the ones we formed here are true or false based on whether P, Q, and R are true or false.